Welcome to the Consummate Athlete Podcast, where we explore what it means to be a well-rounded, happy, goal-crushing athlete. Every week, myself, sports journalist Molly Herford, and cycling coach and kinesiologist Peter Glassford interview experts and chat through all of your training questions. We're excited to have you along for the ride. Hello, welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. DW, how's it going? <laughs> Nothing from him. DW has so. joined us again for this intro. Peter, how's it going? It's going well. I'm still wearing my cross training is not a crime shirt. I brought it back out. This is available in the Consummate Athlete store, along with several other witty niche niche t-shirts yes uh actually one of our upcoming guests and i were laughing about my uh can't stop won't stop canty break one so yeah. very excited about remember that remember the well. days before disc breaks raking cyclocross you need this t-shirt <laughs> but uh I'm, I'm not gonna lie today's guest will not remember those days of racing cyclocross uh we have charlotte Bacchus, a cycling coach watt bike ambassador uh, general badass cyclist on the podcast to talk all things training, some bike packing, adventuring, and learning, uh, and just a lot about her story about, I mean, honestly, the ups and downs of cycling and finding, you know, like losing your love of cycling, finding it again. Uh, I think it's just a really great example of someone who, you know, came into the sport one way and has kind of really shifted gears and has you know, changed the way she looks at cycling. And I think it's a really good lesson for all of us. And I mean, you know, you and I have kind of done this where we've, we've shifted what we do in sport kind of pretty consistently to figure out what, what's working for us, what's not. Uh, but I think a lot of people get really stuck in, I have to be this kind of cyclist or, you know, maybe I'll add something, but I have to, you know, this is how I define myself. Yeah, it's definitely, you know, the cross training is not a crime. What more can I say? Exactly. Yeah, definitely buy the t-shirt. <laughs> in fact, you know what? I'm going to put a discount for that t-shirt oh, in the no. show notes. Oh, no. uh, yeah, let's just actually say it's just going to be crime is the uh is the discount code and i'll oh, do it for like 15 okay. percent off well, there so you, go. Uh, you can head to the constant athlete store to get that but i do like to hear just you know any of these athlete journeys you know sometimes it's, it's interesting to see a little longer term uh you know just yeah they they had a tough go and they came out the other side and you know this is how they did it they tried a different sport you know and you know they, they tried bikepacking they liked bikepacking and you know they got into coaching or doing all these different things i think that's it's really fun to see these different uh case studies or these different athlete stories Exactly. All right. Well, without further ado, I think we should just get right into it. Sounds good. All right. Enjoy this episode with Charlotte Baggett. Charlotte, welcome to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. I am so excited to have you. I'm so excited we we got connected through our mutual friend, Karen, for a totally different thing. And now we get to do this. Yeah, totally. I'm, I'm so excited. That's, I mean, that's why I love this community is you always meet new people every year and you make lifelong connections and we love Karen. <laughs> I know it's it, cycling is so funny to me because you're talking to someone and then within minutes you find out you have, you know, 10, 10 different people in common and not 10 degrees of separation. Like you actually know 10 of the same people and it's the coolest thing. Yeah. It's <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. Okay. So we, we originally talked like a month and a half ago and then we were like, okay, we have to, we obviously have to have you on the podcast, but you had this epic adventure coming up. So you were like, all right, let's, let's talk after it. So talk to me about this Andy's bike packing extravaganza that you and your partner did. Yeah. Um, so my husband, Matthew, um, we last year, <laughs> it's funny how this started because he's always been into ultra racing. I, came from pro UCI, hardcore road racing. So very structured. He came from UCI mountain biking, which was pretty structured, but then he started getting into ultra. And years ago, he did across Utah on his own. And then he did Colorado trail. And then he did Utah mixed epic and all these ultra stuff. So he had been packing and learning and failing and succeeding all of the ultra stuff. Um, and last year, he's like, have you heard of Across Andes? It's in Chile. And I'm like, no, tell me about it. Because I'm like, oh, great. He's thinking of planning something. I'm excited. I could support him. <laughs> and he's like, I signed us up. And I was like, all right, us? <laughs> like, together? He's like, oh, yeah, wow. let's do an ultra. And I was like, let's do it. Um, just the last few years, I've been kind of exploring with lots of disciplines in within cycling um, and skiing, I guess. Um 
And so when he said that, I was like, let's, let's just do this. I want to try ultras. I've always been chasing, like, what am I good at? Am I a hill climber? Am I a crit racer? Am I a stage racer? Am I a time trialist? And I've been playing in those like worlds, but I've always felt like I'm, I need to find my niche. I need to find Mm -hmm. what suits me mentally and physically. Um, So I was like, you know what, let's just do this. This is my new year. I had decided to also get into mountain biking that year. So I thought it was forever away, but then came like two weeks ago, it happened. (laughs) And I was like, wow. (laughs) Um, We packed, it took us four hours to pack everything you know, making sure we had the right bike bags and the setups. Um, so this race is across Andes. It's a thousand kilometer bike packing race in Chile. You start in Kuhiki and you kind of go towards the ocean. So you get like the whole scenery of like, oh, this looks like Colorado. It's rolling plains. And you get into the mountains like, oh, this could be riding in the Park City Mountains. And then all of a sudden you just get up and over the mountains and you're in a rainforest um, with giant leaves. I don't even know what they're called, but it was, it, it's a really known experience. This year was a new route. Um, they had did, done other routes around Santiago. Um, so we were really stoked. Um, I didn't know what to think of thousand kilometers. I, yeah. Matthew how do you prepare me, from that? Like, how do you get ready for that with a road background? <laughs> right. And that honestly, you don't, you, you get prepared by doing it. Um, mm-hmm. so I knew uh, going into this, I really have like the last year of taking that stress out of doing events or doing racing and just saying, Hey, like your goal is to finish or your goal is to do the best you can. Um, I did put uh, during road, I put so much pressure on myself. So I've been really kind of finding this new light of like, it's okay. Just finish the ride, push your limits to what you can, your best capabilities. You learn from your mistakes, you learn from your experience. So I was full in. And the the factor of this year was it was supposed to be really rainy and cold. <laughs> and so we packed everything we needed, like four pairs of gloves, rain jackets, rain pants, long pants, bags and bags and bags. Um, and it was challenging. Uh, the first day was actually wonderful. The start was, you know, kind of cloudy, but beautiful. But then that afternoon is when the rain really began. And going into, we had a goal of going to every checkpoint. And this is something Matthew always told me is you can always have a plan, but it never goes as planned. Mm -hmm. And I learned that. Um, We did make the first day plan of getting to checkpoint one, but we got there fairly late, soaking wet. And it was a learning experience. I'm used to riding every day, um, but not for 14 hours um, or more. (laughs) Um, Oof. And also I'm not used to like riding for continuous time. I usually stop and mountain biking has been making me bad about that where it stopped for snacks, stop mm-hmm. for breaks, stop to go to the bathroom, stop for this. And you kind of have to teach yourself how to keep going, but the stops help break it down. So I think that's a big learning thing I need to start working for. Um, but we get to checkpoint one. It was amazing. It was in a little barn. People were stuffed like sardines in there trying to get warm. We got our little book stamped off. And then it was like, okay, food. We need food now. 911 situation, food. Um, and I'm celiac and dairy free. So oh it's a challenge. Um, usually I've learned how to just navigate through and I have bars with me and whatnot, but it was hard to find food. And so we found this little house slash hostel that was feeding the cyclists. And that's when the culture of Chile really began to start for me. Um, I did not expect anything of what it was. You know, we always like, when we go to a new place, we always have like these visualizations, you go on Google images, you look at this, you look at that and you have, you kind of create this vision, Mm -hmm. nothing like what I visualized. And that's when it was, we walked into this little house and these two, you know, husband and wife were, like three course meal for all these cyclists, you know, like beautiful food. And then they were letting us like sprawl out all our wet clothes and take showers and do all this. Um, and then they let us sleep in their loft for the night. Um, so we got so lucky to be able to dry and kind of refresh. And I woke up 3am and I said, it's time to go. We wanted to get early, start early, 
to ride in the snow rather than the rain because the next day was probably going to be the hardest um and we rode in the snow and it was great and then it turned to rain and then it stopped for a little bit and we made it to this gas station and before that I had started realizing my knee was kind of nagging at me and there's always like that pain where you're like it's achy it's okay we can just manage it was kind of at that point, but it was starting to get into this. Like I can feel my muscles straining. I can feel things straining. So I'm like, I'm going to try to do my best to mitigate this and just keep handling this. And, you know, we can always like, I think as any human, we always try to like pin down things. I'm always like, Oh, it could be this. It could be the saddle. It could be the shoes. It could be the rain. It could be. And so I've done that. I've gone through like over and over in my head, what could have caused this. And I think a lot of it was just, it's like, I haven't done ultra. I've never done multi days yeah. of I've done unbound. That was 14 hours for me. It's a long day, but I never woke up the next day and wrote. I usually woke up and was like, I can't move. I'm good. <laughs> yeah. Rest week, not like a day or two. Yeah. Right. So it, I started kind of being like a little nervous about my mind was great. Everything was fantastic except my knee. So I was like, this is a bike mechanical and we can try to kind of fix it like a bike mechanical, you know, put a patch over it, but you know, how bad of a mechanical is it? And so going into day three, we were doing great managing it, but by day four, it had gotten really, really bad. And I decided to put myself first. There's a lot of things that happen in these races. You know, you make the the trip to get out there, you pay all this money to get out there, the organization and like you kind of mentioned, like doing it with a partner adds a different factor alone. Huge. There's multiple factors, like doing it with a partner. So motivating, like it pushes you to keep going there day two when it was pouring rain, freezing cold. I think we probably would have just thrown in the towel and just said, we're done, but we kept going to this next hostel. So that helped. But then there's also that like, oh man, he's fine and dandy. You know, he's not getting his cool ride in. And so I started finding myself putting pressure on it, but this is where it goes to really know your partners. I mean, Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be your husband, but really make sure you ride with the partners. Um, Matthew and I ride together a lot and he's, we've ridden through horrible rides and we've ridden through wonderful rides. And I think knowing that you're capable of getting through the horrible moments together, um, but also knowing each other very well, um, we were a really good team in that part because I, I was starting to put pressure on myself and he was very adamant about, no, we've made it this far. Let's make the best of this trip. Cause yes, there's racing and there's goals and there's results and all of this. And we are like second place as duo, but then there's also like livelihood and experiencing another culture we've never seen. And instead of just putting our heads down in pain and suffering, we decided to let's just figure out how to get back. <laughs> Let's just see if we can maybe start riding back. And so each day we kind of made our way back and stayed at a hostel and made our way back and really got to experience Chile and all the culture, um, which I think was special in itself. And granted, I knew my knee and, and I made the decision to not get injured. Um, yeah. It's fairly injured, but it wasn't to the point of no returns. Um And, you know, I was thinking, wrapping up this trip, I kind of wrote a blog and I was like, you know, through our failures, we could say the failures. I mean, that's kind of a rough word, but through our failures, we learn the most. Um, For sure. And I learned so much. And so right after that, we signed up for the goats in Portugal next year. (laughs) Um, So we're already planning the next one. So it was a huge experience well worth it kind of dipping my tone to the ultra world. And I know a lot of people who do their first ultras, it's, it's in, not successful, you mm-hmm. know, it doesn't go as planned, your knees hurt. So it's a lot of just strength training. And so my winter going into this winter, I'm, and I'm a coach. So I like, I, I coach people. I tell them this, I tell them that and ultra is so different. <laughs> I'm so used to being like, okay, yeah, strength training, but really it's based on strength. Yeah. Yes. There's, fitness to it. Um, but it's really kind of making sure you do these functional training and strength movements. So my winter this year is going to be a bit different. Um, going into next year, doing more mountain biking and ultra and gravel. Um, but it was, it's fun to learn that. Yeah. 
nutrition side of that too. And the mental, I mean, it's like the, the full picture. There's so many puzzle pieces. The second you go beyond like a single day of anything, there's just so many more puzzle pieces that start to kind of come into play there. Um, and actually, I really like that you mentioned your coach because a lot of coaches actually really struggle to uh, do for themselves what they would tell an athlete to do. So do you ever run through that? Like, as you were, you know, on that day three and you're kind of like debating what to do, did you run through like, if a client was having this issue, what would I tell them? Exactly. Yes. I used to kind of brush it through me when I started becoming a coach. I was like, well, I'm different. No, I'm not. I'm the same. I, and, and that's why I have a coach myself because yeah, like even like any psychologist or a therapist, you know, they, we all have our own struggles and sometimes we don't want to listen to ourselves, our own yeah. critical self. Um, so yeah, I think that was like, you said that really well. Cause many times I was like, well, if I was telling someone, what yeah. would I do? If and someone so, else emailed me and said like, I'm on day three of uh, three of, you know, eight and my knee is really bothering me. And I'm like, afraid it's going to be injured. Like, how would you respond to that? Of course you would tell them to stop. Yeah. We are our worst critics. Um, 100%. And it can hurt, but I've, I've learned over the years too, is like being a role model in this community is really important because mm-hmm. there's a lot of outside fuzzy information and, and like pressure. And so if we yeah. have people internally that are good role models and show the realness and show that it sucks, but make the best of those situations, I think that's what helps keep the community tight and keeps them away from all these other pressures. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And actually I, I made a note as you were talking and sort of talking about your road racing background, I'd love for you to talk about, you know, you started racing at like a relatively young age, you know, how, what was the, the pressure to perform like, you know, in the road and sort of like moving through that environment and like kind of coming to where you are now, because I think a lot of people listening may, they, they may not be like 16, 17 and getting into racing, but they have kids who are. So I think this is like such an important topic, whether you're a racer or a parent. So talk to me about that experience as like a younger athlete. Yeah, I feel like younger pressure is, I don't know, the way you look at pressure is so different. Um, I My main background is in psychology and I love studying why we think, why kids like the development of kids and through life. And I just remember when I was young, pressure didn't seem as hard. Um my parents were really awesome. They were super supportive. They'd do anything to get me anywhere. And so, you know, we started with the club sport, grew up to a a club team and then like getting on a team team, a development team, and then moving and doing all the state races, like every single race, my parents would drive me every weekend to a race. Um, so showing your support as a, a parent is really important, but not in a pushy way, just saying, Hey, like, always checking in my parents my dad would always check in with me because I was one of those kids my sister I have an older sister she was stuck on one thing it was three-day eventing horseback riding awesome super passionate she still does it that's her one thing and I was the one kid that was like oh I want to try swimming oh I want to do lacrosse or I want to do this I want to do that and my mom was like it's never gonna stick and so came high school they're like you know Charlotte you need to choose I was like bikes I'll do bikes (laughs) um it's so a sneaky then, one to choose because there's so many different routes in bikes. So you yeah, still managed to pick yeah. a sport where you had 10 different sub sports. I love it. Yeah. But it's hard, you know, like seeing at a young age, it's easy to be like, and I'm not a parent, so I can't say too much yet, but um, I would, you know, put myself in a parent's shoes and I would totally want my kids to be into bikes. Like first mm-hmm. thing when they're out. And I think it's great, but I think doing other sports goes in hand with cycling, you know, doing soccer, getting the experience of other things because that all will fitness comes later in life. Yep. But those motor skills and the mental stability and the the mental strength of learning how to lose games, um, that really comes in handy for the future. Mm-hmm. And that's harder to gain when you're older. So yeah. I, when I, I didn't, I did a really great, I had a great coach as a junior for many, many years. It was when I kind of got into is more male based. So all the group rides I did males, it would just yep. be like a big, big show of like hanging in for dear life, trying to survive. Um, I remember those years for myself too. Yep. yep. 
<laughs> and it, you know, my, my team, my development team is called prestige imports based out of Denver. We, I drive, I would get out of school early every day and every Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'd do this like mock race at Meridian. And then like two other days of the week, I'd drive an hour to go to practice. Um, and then the weekends I'd go racing. So I did so much driving, um, yep. which is why I love podcasts, <laughs> but <laughs> It was, it was a great experience and the team I was on was mainly boys. So I was really pushed to step out of my boundaries, but also just learn about myself. Um, I think any child going through high school is always confused of who they are and, oh, going to college. And I went to a very up end high school that was like, once you're a freshman, you're thinking about college. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I don't know what I want to do yet. And I want to be good at bike racing and and so my upbringing into cycling was wonderful because it started where we did events like Elephant Rock or Copper Triangle, moving to like local races and doing local races and then kind of just being a part of guest riding for women's teams um, where I got to be mentored by amazing women. And then that kind of drove me to deciding to go to college for cycling. So I went to Fort Lewis College for road cycling and then that was a whole other world of just trying everything, doing track, um, doing time trials, team racing, kind of different aspect that I wasn't really used to. And that's when I also got into being a Cat 1 um, UCI racer, doing Red Lens, Gila, Cascade, Colorado, <laughs> the sad races that are no longer here. Like pour one um, out. Yeah. <laughs> my favorites. And so I, I don't think I'll take back any of those days of being able to race. But I know through psychology, I know some people are great with pressure and some people struggle. And I feel like when we go into that sport, we always think that we're capable of dealing with the pressure and we should be like, it's, it's part of the sport. We have to be willing to be with that pressure. And one day, you know, I, I was one of the riders that would just try so hard. I'm not, I don't have the genes. I maybe have a little bit, but not like those natural talented genes. So I was always pushed to work as hard as possible. I mm -hmm. train as hard as possible, you know, driving every weekend. One year, I remember counting, I did 99 races. Um, and they're, you know, they're all short. It's like, but it was but just. Nonetheless, that's a lot yeah. of race days. Like that's so yeah. much. Yeah. And so I think I kind of just pushed myself to be the best. And I won one year I realized, because I was always trying to, you know, we always want to win. Winning yeah. is great. I had, I had won a lot of state championship races and stuff like that. And I know what winning was, but I wanted to win like UCI races. You wanted to get to that next level. And that kind of, I didn't know what that winning was like. And so one of our home races in college, I won. It was a huge deal. My dad was there. He was sobbing. And I turned and my team was not happy with me um, because road racing, you learn that things sometimes don't go as planned. And for that moment, I realized I'm like, I'm not a winner. This is too much. I cannot win. And it's funny because, you know, moms do know best. Um, before that, my mom was always like, I don't think you're, I don't think you're competitive, Charlotte. And I was like, mom, you're so funny. Like, that's ridiculous. Like, don't tell me that. She's like, you're not. And that's the day I realized that I'm more of a workhorse. Um, I like to aid in the fact to making people successful. And that's when I started understanding who I was as a human. And to have that through sport was really cool. But then from realizing that, I knew that the pressure could be tough. Um, and there's a lot of pressure, especially that time. I mean, women's cycling has gone really far, but there was a lot of pressure of being skinny, being light, and not just in women's cycling, but men's cycling. And I was going to say, I actually always found that honestly, it was more my male teammates that gave me more oh, of like a complex around like eating yeah. and like what you yeah. could or couldn't have, or like how light you needed to be yeah. compared to the women, like funny enough. Yeah. In college, it was awful. I was like, you guys all have eating disorders. I'm sorry. 100%. But in high school, I was hospitalized for an eating disorder. So I knew a lot about, and I was still, I mean, it's still, you're always working with it. Um, 
it's not like you're cured. It's not, it's, you know, it's just something you're always aware of. And I think that's when it started to become a bit toxic. Mm -hmm. And again, road, some people are, are incredible at that pressure, but we also have to just listen to ourselves and know that like, that's not the end all be all. And mm -hmm. I always visualize, I was like, I want to go to the Olympics. I want to do this and road and road. And, and then I started realizing, you know, it's a toxic environment for me and maybe one day it won't be, you know, maybe I can go back and do the local road races and not win, not do great, but still enjoy it. Um, and that's where my mentality as a coach and just a human is when someone's always struggling with riding or something, and it starts becoming a task. I'm always like, what's your reason? Why do you ride? Because yes, it could be a profession, could be a hobby, but there's always a reason why you start those professions and those hobbies. Mm -hmm. And you have to remember that because I lost that um, a little before COVID. I was, it was becoming a task. I was kind of relapsing into just how skinny can you get? How fast can you get? How fast can you get up this hill? Because I was at the top level. Yeah, I was there. I was strong because it's such a short time period of when you lose all that weight and you're really strong. Um, yeah. Well, and I think, okay, so that's actually like this very interesting thing that I'm seeing like played out kind of over and over again, you know, with athletes talking about it on social media. It's always like, I have a bit of a, a bit of a clutch with it because often when an athlete comes out and says they had an eating disorder, it comes right at the time where they've had all of these like fantastic results. So even though they're saying that the eating disorder was bad, unfortunately it's then linked to the fact that they had these results. And it's like, often it hasn't cut, like they haven't, uh, you know, hit the decline phase yet. Yeah. So I think it ends up like perpetuating this like scary narrative that like, yeah, you do actually have that point where you lose the weight and you are really fast, but the aftermath of that, it's just, it's horrible. It blows up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's sad because it feeds it. It totally feeds. And I was being fed that I was getting fast. I yeah. was doing well. And then it came crashing down. Um, COVID year when I got on 2024, um, Nicola Kramer is an amazing person. She has done so much for that team and I wanted to do so much for that team, but the pressure of like trying to do well, I was overtraining. I was underweight. She was trying to give me the opportunity trying to get me to see that, like, it's not about that. Mm -hmm. um, but I was so stuck in this like previous of, oh, I'm doing so well um, that I just came crashing down. I got COVID turned into pneumonia. I didn't address the situation. I was still training and it took over my right lung and to this day, I'm still working back my lung strength. Um, but I always believe things happen for a reason. Um, mm -hmm. I, it happened for a reason for me. I learned so much about myself. I became way more confident through that failure. I hate that word. I need to I find like, that. Yeah, we need to find like a better word. But I think, you know what? Let's just say we're reclaiming the term failure. Yeah. Reclaiming. How about that? Reclaiming yeah. it. It's now a positive. Yeah. <laughs> but that has helped me so much with the mindset of now how I coach, how yeah. I do nutrition, how I help other people and how I like continue to race myself. I still race at the high level. Granted, I'm getting back, but it's so different. And that's why I went to gravel. Um, I love road. My heart's always with road. It's great. One, it's a bit harder to ride now because cars, I've had multiple friends hit and some friends killed. Mm -hmm. um, so the mountain bike's fun because you don't really see much. I mean, I guess there's bears and moose, but I don't know, cars. Yeah, just me. I'll take bear and moose over driver any day of the week. Yeah, so through that experience, I think I've learned a lot of the challenges of the psychology and what your brain does during all this different kind of situation. So I think with that experience, I'm able to help others. And that's where I've kind of gained a lot of the knowledge, but I love the gravel scene because first getting into, it, I was afraid because I was so lean. I didn't really know if I was capable of doing a hundred miles, mm -hmm. you know, it, it gets scary. I get scared. And at first that fear was really challenging, just kind of like mountain biking. When I started, I was scared. I was like, oh my gosh, it's a huge rock. But then now using that fear to build my inner strength and confidence, that was cool. Now, when I get on the mountain bike, I'm scared. I'm scared, but it's like, oh my gosh, I'm scared. This is awesome. Let's utilize this moment. Um, so 
the gravel was cool because it was like everyone was there even joe schmo from nebraska um you'd meet so many new people and they were there just in awe of like okay i'm gonna try to do this 100 mile ride and i'm gonna try and then after it's like here's a beer let's eat all the food and so that really relieved that pressure um to make it not toxic and so that's when i started kind of getting into that world because I was, I'm young. I'm still young. Um, but then I was very young. And sometimes when you're young, your judgment isn't great. Um, and you think you're doing the best, but maybe you're not. And I, I try that with like, you know, oh, this is not a toxic situation. I'm fine. I'm fine. And my mom would be calling me like, nah, this is not good. You don't look great. And I'd be like, I'm fine. So oh. making that decision was my next step into knowing how we can change our minds and how we can change who we are in a good, positive way. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm kind of digressing. No, this is fantastic. I love this. (laughs) I love where you've taken this because one of the things I really wanted to talk to you about, uh, you know, both in like your school experience or like your uh, academic experience and your personal experience, like you went for psychology and you also have, you know, advanced nutrition or sports nutrition certifications. How do these two things intersect? Because I mean, obviously we know they do, but from your personal experience and just, you know, what you've learned, like, how can we like talk to me about how you need both of those things to kind of find a good, a good healthy spot. And especially in a sport like cycling where weight is such a like still constant topic, right? Like even if you're, you know, even if you say you don't care about it, if you get on Zwift, the first thing they ask is your weight because they need it for your power to weight. Oh goodness me, yes. <laughs> right? Like you cannot escape it in cycling, even if you have no, like, even if you don't want to, <laughs> to you know, interact with it. Yeah, I had to make the decision last year to pull away from the ZRL. Not because they're, I think what they're doing, I'm a, I'm an original Zwifter, uh, one of their first beta riders, but um. <laughs> The, you know, you had to take videos of you stepping on the scale. And I knew like, I would always just be like, oh my God, am I going to be heavier? And it would be in the afternoon. I'd be like, I had breakfast that made me heavier. So like, I understand it from like the competition standpoint, but like, yeah, I'd be out. Absolutely not. Yeah. (laughs) So I decided last year to jump into the community leagues because you do like a picture and that's it. And you don't have to do videos and I still sometimes get stressed about that um, because it is such a huge thing for the game because that's all the algorithm is the lighter you are, the faster you are on that game. But Mm -hmm. also the lighter you are, the more it sucks going downhill and trying to save a draft. So that is a good tip. Um, If you're at a decent weight, it's easier to draft and go downhill. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, I mean, psychology is this premise of everything. I always think that's kind of the stem of everything, our development, uh, how our brains think. A lot of the way we think of psychology is like the sports psychology, like, okay, mental toughness. How do I get through this workout? Start line jitters. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's great. It works. There's methods we do like through the ultra racing. I had an athlete ask me a wonderful question. He was like, what was your mental state during these moments of the good and the bad? And I'm like, there's that, but there's also the relationship with food. Huge. And that's very psychologically based because food chemically hits receptors on our tongue that hit receptors in our brain, but it's also our livelihood. So of course our bodies are going to need it. And we can try to say, Hey, I hate food. It's, it's annoying or because that's what we make it. Um, and it's, it's hard for me to always say this of like, Oh, just do this. If I've, I've had some athletes with eating disorders where you can't just say, just do this. It's not easy. Um, Mm -hmm. You can't just do it. There's so much involved with psychology and food where it becomes habitual. Um, And some habits are great and some habits aren't. Um, It's always good to try to tap into yourself and know like, is this habit okay? And one of the greatest people who I love talking with is Alan Lim of Scratch Labs. Love he he knows his stuff um we would sit for hours talking about science and psychology but he actually just did a recent podcast where and he said this before you know they were like so how do you know if it's an eating disorder how do you know if this person's struggling with food and he's like ask that person if they're eating in isolation how many times are you eating alone each day and if it's like constant 
that's a problem with food because it's a very social thing. And I always realize like going back to when I had mine, I was eating in isolation. I was in my college room eating alone, probably all, probably all meals of the day. I never went out. I never ate with my friends. I meal prepped all my meals, which was great. Meal prepping is awesome, but the isolation can cause challenges. Um, then you start creating weird food habits. And of course, everyone like eating disorders or not has weird food habits. Um, but there's ones that can just get in the way. And like mine used to be certain utensils or like, I, I love using chopsticks. Um, and it's okay if I use chopsticks sometimes, but if it's like an everyday thing where I like have to, or things like that, where it's like, it gets in the way of your living where it's like, mm -hmm. oh, you can use a fork. It's okay. Um, that's a good sign. Yeah. And so, and it's not that you, it's hard because it's like, it's not that like, that's a bad thing. It's good to notice that. And always, sometimes I like notice a weird habit that might be coming up because again, like I always thought I'd be cured. I found that out a couple of years ago. No, <laughs> it's something you always have to work on, but it's always different. It's like in a different way. And I used to like, when someone would like Matthew would mention like, that's weird. I'd be like, oh my God, that's not weird. I'm like mean, you're, you're weird. So mean. <laughs> but then it's now I'm like, wait, maybe it is weird. You know, maybe it is like socially weird and. So if the more, what helped me the most with like kind of understanding eating disorders and nutrition and psychology was knowing the science, knowing one, the science. And this is why I got into nutrition because the science of food is incredible. How we actually really need carbohydrates, how to utilize carbohydrates and make it a, like for women doing it periodically. Sometimes you need more during certain times of the month. You need more carbohydrates. That's why you're craving the bread. It's really learning how to listen to your body cues, but also know the science of nutrition. And that's, I think knowledge is power. So the psychology and the nutrition go in hand when you understand the science of both. And so I always recommend people to really learn about it. Yeah. I like, you kind of made this really good point in that, in that conversation we just had where you, you mentioned like the intention really matters, right? Like you can meal prep and it can actually be an extremely healthy thing to do. Right. Like it's a very positive thing. We highly recommend it. But if you're meal prepping with the intention of, you know, cutting your calories and, you know, making sure that no one has, like, no one can see you eat and like, no one can like point out what you're eating. Like that's where it becomes a problem. So it's not that the meal prepping is bad. It's about the intention behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's the, what are you thinking? Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, it's, it's hard to track and it's, it's, it's honestly hard to catch. Yeah. You know, it, it's a, such a habitual thing that you kind of just, it's like breathing. We don't think of like, Oh, I'm actually breathing right now mm -hmm. or you know, like breathing in between bites. We don't think about that stuff. So some of these like habits become crazy habits. And I know over the years and Matthew can say this, but I've changed a lot because I've been really working on like, I want to be more social because it is such an isolated thing. And what Alan said was so right of how many times do you eat alone? It's okay to eat alone, like breakfast or mm -hmm. whatever, because we can't always sync our meals together. But if you go out and you're eating, you feel weird, you feel socially weird. Um, that's, that's, a good sign. And yes, I, I would say I can still go out and I feel socially weird because celiac doesn't really help, <laughs> but it's a different kind of weird. It's more of like, yeah, I got to order something different, but we can, that's easy to change. So let's be like, okay, let's find something to eat mm -hmm. where it's like, if I don't want to go out because I don't want to eat in front of people. That's the sign. And like you said, meal prep is great. Um, I recommend it for a lot of people who are super busy but if yeah. there's an intention behind it, that's a little more sour, then maybe rethink it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love it. I love it. Okay. We've now mentioned all of the different cycling disciplines you do. How do you structure a year when you have like, you know, oh, I'm going to do this gravel thing, but I'm also going to do train for this ultra thing. And also I'm skiing. Like, how do you lay out your schedule? Yeah, it's actually funny because I just spent all day yesterday planning my year out for events. 
Um, right. and there's still more that probably will be added. Um, I always say the sky's the limit. Um, of course there's financial stuff that gets there, but I always like to plan it out and put it all on a piece of paper and say, okay, pick and choose what looks good. And I'm seeing a lot of MTV gravel. There's road, there's road, um, ultra and some skiing possibly, but a lot of strength during the winter. I'm really taking this next month off and just doing Pilates and functional and TRX. And I actually joined the gym because, you know, COVID, it was like, let's have all this equipment at home. And it's great. But sometimes again, that human connection of like, oh, where were you? You weren't in class the other day. Mm -hmm. We're making new friends at the gym. And yes, it's the local gym. And you know, most of the class is like 75 year old women, but they're so they're lovely firing. I'm like mm -hmm. the other day in Pilates, I'm like trying to do this, like hip flexor move, which is cyclist's worst enemy. Um, and like these ladies are all doing it. And I'm like, I can't take a break, you know? And they're like, <laughs> you okay. So I love doing those classes. So I'll be doing those, but yeah, it's a lot, you know, usually I'm used to being, you can only stick to one discipline. And I think if you're going hardcore, stick to that one discipline. But as we're seeing, there's a lot of people that are doing many disciplines. And as a coach over the years, we can train for one thing. And that's important if we're really into it. But cycling goes in hand in all directions. Mountain biking is really good for the skills, really good for some high intensity, really good for knowing how to move the bike beneath you. That was the first biggest learning curve on the mountain bike was I was trying to turn uphill and Matthew's like, you know, you can pedal through turns. I was like, huh? And then I could go uphill finally. Um, because I was trying to like not pedal and be normal on the saddle and let the bike turn with me. Whereas like, no, you need to be on the nose of the saddle and you need to pedal through the turn. So yep. <laughs> that skill helps or gravel gravel helps with the long distance, the endurance. Um, I like having these different races because it's nice to see the different cultures within cycling. Um, like the ultra racing really allows you to travel. Um, you can go to different countries every year. That's Matthew's goal every year is to go to a different country and do an ultra race. Well, so I'm like, I'm in. <laughs> so when, um, so yeah, it's a hard balance, but I look at it as being well-versed as a cyclist is really important for longevity. I always like to ask people, how long do you want to do this sport? And I don't really hear anybody that says, well, maybe like a year, you know, they're like, I want to do this forever. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to not break down when I'm older. And that biggest, the biggest tip for that is to be well-versed. So training for these different kind of things, like ultra training is like pretty much base training, like hitting out at 130 BPM zone two for hours and hours and hours and not stopping. That's going to be another aspect of my training. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, with the different disciplines, mountain biking, road biking, gravel racing, it's all so different. Um, so usually if I have an event the week before I'm like, I'm on that bike. Usually like, I'd say if it's like, for me, the weak spot is mountain biking for skills. And so let's say I had a gravel race and a mountain bike race local, nothing too major. Um, I would be on the mountain bike, right? That mountain bike right away. Mm -hmm. Because if you know, like, okay, I'm really good at gravel, but my mountain biking is eh, stick to that or ride, you know, switch the bikes back and forth. And I love that because it keeps it interesting, you know, like trail riding so different from gravel riding and road riding so different from trail riding. So I like that because it keeps it really diverse, but the biggest thing is to know, to listen to your body. Um, I used to not take many breaks. I would always take, you know, maybe one day off a week, but with ultra and all these doing these different disciplines, you kind of find yourself taking more than one day off. And usually that freaked me out. Um, from Chile, I really have, I've only ridden the bike two days in the last 15, 12 days or whatever, how long I've been back and I'm not freaking out. I'm okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of learning how to really maximize your body efficiency, but stay healthy. Um, yeah. and doing strength in between, honestly, get the skills of cycling, get the skills of each bike, but also do the strength off the bike. Um, Huge. the off the bike stuff is so important. And I preach that a lot. Yeah. And I mean, especially this time of year, right? Like you could just like attach yourself to the trainer and just be trainer all winter. 
or you could use this as an opportunity to, you know, spend some time on the trainer. Like we're, we're pro trainer here. Um, but also, yeah, get into the gym, do the strength, try the Pilates, like do all of that different stuff. So I think that's like such a, yeah. such a great, this is such a great time of year for it. Yeah. And the trainer, honestly, like, I love that during the winter because I don't like riding. I've decided, you know, I will ride out if it's cold, you know, once in a blue moon, if I have to, if it's a race, but I'm not going to go train on it out in it because it's, it's not really effective. You don't really get your training done. So the, the trainer, yeah, it can be challenging, but it gets such good work done and you don't even have to do an hour. You could do yeah. a half hour each day. Matthew last year did 30 minutes, like three days a week. And he's like, fit as a pistol. He's so Love fast. That. I'm like, well, it was just 30 minutes every day. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it is efficient for that for sure, which yeah. is yeah, what makes it great. And I think people also get it in their heads that they have to do the same amount of hours on the trainer that they would outside. No, no. no please don't do that. Very if sweaty. You can, go for it. I mean, it's <laughs> amazing what some people do. Um, but if you're trying to force yourself to don't, um, yeah. and that's why I say, always reach out to your coach for advice. Cause there's a ton of workouts out there you can choose, but are they right for you at the right time? Which ones? And I usually like to say an hour of power is perfect. You don't really hmm. need anything over because if you're doing cross training, if you're doing this, you're going to stay fit. You're not losing fitness. Usually it gets dusty. Like if you hmm. do base season, your upper end's going to get a bit dusty. It's just yeah. like, okay, I'm not, I haven't read that book in a few years. So I'm going to try reading it now. And it's a little rough at first. You're like, I can't read this first page but once you get going it that's when but that's again seasonal making sure you have those seasons and I actually use a trainer year-round um it's very convenient mm -hmm. um but I know it's challenging for some yeah yeah okay and then the flip side we are actually coming up on this time of year where everyone gets into the whether you know whatever challenge you have between Christmas and New Year's the you know for cyclists the Rafa festive 500 is oh, yeah the thing, right? So any tips for riders who are like thinking about doing, doing one of those like week long, like whether it's a, you know, training camp sort of in the off season or the Rafa Festa 500, any thoughts or tips towards like that? Like, you know, you're kind of at like a lower level of training volume. And then like, suddenly you're going to have this huge uptick. Yeah. How does someone get ready for that? And then actually like yeah. survive it. Ooh. Yeah. I mean, it's, I think that's next week or something. I know um, it's coming. Yeah. <laughs> comes too fast, but yeah, it's when, what happens when you push a whole bunch of volume up right away injury. Um, yeah. <laughs> biggest thing to think about is recovery off the bike. Um, it's totally doable. It's not like you're going to get injured. You just have to do it, approach it well. And I always say kind of even like the beginning of any ultra race, this is something I'm also going to used to is you don't have to go hard. You yeah. don't have to pedal to the metal red zone eyeballs popping out of your head. Yes. A lot of people do that. You'll see people really pushing hard and it's like, Oh, I wish I could don't compare yourself to others. This is your 500. This is your camp. This is for you and take this time for yourself. And it's easy. We all compare to others. I do it all the time. I'm like, oh my gosh, they rode like 200K more than me this week. And, mm -hmm. but catch yourself, say, okay, that's okay. I'm okay to compare, but this is my ride. If I take it at my pace, I will be the most successful. If you take it based on comparisons to other people, it's going to crumble. Um, and that's something we all have to live with and learn because it's okay to compare it's okay to be competitive. That's what motivates you to do this in the first place. Um, but really take those, let's say it's like the Rafa 500, those each day, really take care of yourself after the bike and yes. sleep. Sleep is your friend. And usually, and it's like during the event, you might not sleep well, or especially the night before don't panic. It's okay. I'd say leading up to the event, try to bank on some more sleep. Um, try to add some more to the sleep bank because yeah, usually during and before you're not, or like the day before you're not going to sleep mm -hmm. and then we panic and then we're up until later. And then we're like, Oh my gosh, what am I doing? And then we're stressing ourselves. So it's really trying to reduce stress as best as you can. Um, and then right after every ride, I think recovery is always something we skimp on. 
we either just go straight to shower or straight to work or get a meal in, but we really want to focus on a proper recovery, like shake. Um, you don't have to buy powders. You can crunch the numbers, but you really want four to one. So four grams of carb to one gram of protein, especially if it's like going a hundred miles every day or hundred K mm-hmm. every day. Um, you're still burning into your glycogen. And if you fuel during your rise, that's great. That's really important, but you're still burning into your glycogen stores. And so for your body to actually make protein synthesis happen, it needs energy. Um, and this is like an always like key role that if your body doesn't have carbohydrates as a main source of energy, if it doesn't have that energy, it can't build muscle. It can't restore. So there's this like glorious four to one ratio of carbs to protein that it doesn't have to be within a 30 minute window, but as soon as possible, as soon as you can, it helps with hunger. It helps with energy levels. Sometimes I've noticed a lot of athletes that didn't do it would have like this horrible slump in the afternoon. If you ride in the morning, um, they'd be like, I'm so tired because your body was like, I, I'm sorry. I had to like dip into deep down reserves. (laughs) And also if you're like, well, I don't get a slump internally you don't feel this but if you don't give your body the proper energy it's going to eat away muscle because there is glycogen in muscle um the muscle always stores glycogen and if it has no other source to get carbohydrates to really make those atp molecules sorry i'm getting scientific um love it love it it it's going to start eating the muscle away so it can get to those reserves and so Mm -hmm. all the work that you're doing is just going down the drain (laughs) yep yeah, literally. Yep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and then, you know, to kind of come back to almost where we started this conversation talking about that ultra you did, I think it's also important to just kind of like caveat this with like, if you do start noticing that you're getting injured, stop doing it. <laughs> it's not worth it. I mean, if you want to do this for a long time, it's just, it's not worth it. No matter what is in the way of like, oh, I was at a good result or, oh, oh my partner's fine. Or, oh, I could just push through this. Because I do have to tell you, I got guilty feelings after I stopped. Sure. I was like, my knee feels fine. I should have just suffered through. But then I'm like, remember the feeling. It was an injury. And yep. we can always be our worst critics. And so take that criticism. And what we usually do is we try to like shove it away and be like, ah, oh, whatever. But be like, oh, no, no, it's okay. Criticize me right now. I'll, I'll sit with myself and have conversations with myself. It's weird, but. I'll be like, yep. okay, criticize me. Go ahead. Let's just sit on it. It's okay. It's normal. But what are we going to do about it? Mm-hmm. We're not going to just try to skirt around. I always like to look at the big picture of like, okay, many ultras to come. I'm young. If you're old, you still have time. You know, yeah. it's like, there's oh. so much that happens in a year. Yeah. I talked to a marathoner today who's in his eighties. He's going for the world record this weekend, which by the way, is like, a 305 marathon. So little perspective. Wow. He's like, I'm hoping I can run 709 pace. I'm like, Ooh, what? literally like my like high level intervals here. Uh, but <laughs> beside the point, he took six years off for like some hamstring wow. issues. Yeah. And he is currently, you know, American record holder going for the world record. So like time off, not going to wreck you. <laughs> It's you've, not, you've got yeah, time. It's challenging to get back to it. But also when you start getting to the pointy end, like little things are so hard to get like one watt increase in your FTP is so hard to get. I love coaching athletes that are new because yeah. it's like, Oh my gosh, you increase like 30 Watts or it's just crazy. So that's that whole premise of like, there's this like periodization where you take two weeks off or you take an off season to bring that like curve down. Everyone freaks out. They're like, I'm I'm going backwards. My CTL is so low. Everything's so low. And I'm like, that's what we want. And they're like, what? Hmm. Are you okay? And I'm like, yes, we want to bring it down so we can bring that fitness back because then your body really allows to restore and get better. But yeah, for doing that like Festa 500, I think also, or, or camp or whatever, giant load, really make sure you do some functional movement before getting on the bike. Give yourself like at least 30 minutes of warm up time. Yeah, you might be getting some extra miles in or whatever, but that warm up is so crucial because if you're just jumping into it, doesn't allow for blood flow. And then after getting a cool down. Yeah. And making sure you and and this can be hard for people who have desk jobs and whatnot, but making sure you get in and out of the seat, 
throughout the day, if you do it in the mornings or you stay active because blood flow is the biggest thing for recovery. You want to actually keep active. And if you have any points that are sore, um, not injury type, ice, heat, ice, use tiger balm. Um, there's all these things you can do to kind of mitigate it, but the stretching before and after warming up recovery shake after that's like a protocol, um, then a meal and then staying with good nutrition. Of course you can have like pizza. Of course we can indulge, but making sure that recovery shake is important. Mm -hmm. Making sure a lot of people too, is like they overdo the fiber. Um, I did that a lot because I was totally into salads and they're great. Salads are wonderful, but save that for like when you're not targeting being successful for yep. an activity. Um, I know during my ultra, I actually really didn't eat too much fiber and that was great. Cause yeah. I like my stomach was happy. <laughs> yeah. Um, and also when you're really like pushing your body at these levels, it doesn't hurt to help with some prebiotics, probiotics and enzymes especially if you're eating a lot on the bike. And this is the biggest tip I have for people is our brains really run on glycogen. Um, and if your brain starts to be like, ah, I don't know if I can do this next hill or getting into this, like, oh, I don't know about this. That's a sign of low glycogen. That's when you need to take some kind of simple carb, some kind of bite to eat a gel, something, because that is before it hits your muscles. So then by the time that settles in, you're okay. Yeah. Um, or Ooh, rather usually we're too late. We bonk and, and you know what? Bonking's going to happen. Mark the time span, like really notice, like, why did that bonking happen? What was the cause? Because if we, we tend to let it happen and we talk about it, but then we don't really actually know. And so for that to happen again, it's going to happen again. <laughs> yeah. It's coming right back to that learning from our failures thing. Like a bonk yeah. is a, is a mini failure just an opportunity to learn. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. I've learned lots about from my bonking. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I learned that lesson often. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it, you know, honestly, like during it sucks too. So it's really good to change the mindset of like, oh, great. I get to learn how to get up and over this wall. Mm -hmm. What's on the other side, that really awesome euphoric feeling of success and getting up and over that. And so you can change your brain. Um, it's hard. It's not easy to change our thoughts but you can always try to start and just give it the benefit of the doubt. Oh, I love it. Oh my gosh. This has been such a fantastic hour of covering so many things. Tell everyone where they can find you, follow you, talk to you about coaching, all of the things. Yeah. So I have kind of my own little business called exquisite endurance coaching. So you can find that exquisite endurance coaching.com. Um, I also, so my little brand is a unicorn. Um, that's our inner unicorn. That's like, kind of just shines out of nowhere. Um, I love unicorns. Um, and then of course you can always message me on Instagram at Charlotte Backus. You'll see me, you can just see the profile and it's someone with lots of bikes and I'm very naturally organic about posting stuff. Um, but yeah, and you can always email me at Charlotte Backus at me.com, but you can always find myself. So Thank you. I love it. Love so it. Thank you so much. So much fun chatting with you. Thanks so much for tuning into the Consummate Athlete Podcast. If you want to hear more training, racing, and endurance sport advice, make sure you subscribe to the podcast and leave us a rating and review. You can also subscribe to our newsletter at consummateathlete.com for a weekly dose of inspiration and advice straight to your inbox. 